Thank you for joining us for SRCD's webinar towards a global science of child development, challenges and opportunities. This is the first in a series of webinars discussing ways to increase global diversity in the study of child development. SRCD is very committed to broadening and participation globally in developmental science. And this year we'll hold three such events, each focused on a different aspect of globalization in the study of child development. To begin this webinar, we would like to invite Professor Nancy Hill, president of SRCD to say a few words. Thank you, Lahair. Welcome to this webinar toward a global science of child development. Webinars like this are central to the mission and strategic goals of SRCD. SRCD's mission is to advance developmental science and the use of developmental science to improve human lives. And to do this, it's essential that developmental science is conclusive of the vast and diverse experiences and human expression. But to date, so much of our knowledge has focused on Western white privileged populations, which is a mere fraction of the whole global human experience. But to rebalance our knowledge on human development, we need webinars like this who draw back the curtain and discuss things like the experiences of researchers in underrepresented regions, the process of building capacity for doing global research on human development and broadening the participation in developmental science, and indeed building capacity in investigating and integrating diversity into developmental science are two of the strategic goals of our strategic plan. And so it is my pleasure and joy that SRCD is putting together this series of webinars focused on global developmental science. And it is a joy and pleasure to participate and welcome you to this webinar this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. I'd like to begin by introducing the speakers for this webinar. So I'm very pleased to introduce six speakers for our webinar, for our first webinar. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Bobby Chun. Dr. Chun is an Earl Stadman investigator at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development at the National Institutes of Health in the US. Prior to joining the NICHD, Dr. Chun was an associate professor at the School of Social Sciences of Nanyang Technological University in Singapore and a principal investigator at the Singapore Institute for Clinical Sciences of ASTAR in Singapore. Dr. Chan will speak to us about barriers to internationalization, specifically with respect to publishing research, drawing some of his recent studies on how geographical representation in research is both communicated and interpreted in publications. Following that, we'll hear from Dr. Reiko Mazuka. Dr. Mazuka is the team leader for the Laboratory in Language Development at Riken Center for Brain Sciences in Japan. And Dr. Mizuka is also a research professor at the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at Duke University. Dr. Mizuka studies infants' phonological development and early language acquisition, primarily working with Japanese infants and children. Dr. Mizuka will speak to us about considerations and challenges in establishing research programs working with underrepresented populations. Third, we will hear from Dr. Dana Basnight Brown. Dr. Basnight Brown resides in Nairobi, Kenya where she has served as an Associate Professor of Psychology and the Director for the Center of Cognitive and Developmental Research at the U.S. International University in Africa. She's currently an Associate Director for the Psychological Science Accelerator, a globally distributed network of laboratories representing more than 80 countries across six continents. Dr. Basnight Brown will speak to us about advantages and opportunities in globalizing developmental research, drawing on her experience conducting both large-scale and experimental studies in child development in Kenya. Fourth, we'll hear from Dr. Natalia Dutra, who's an assistant professor at the Federal University of Pará in Brazil, with a PhD in development psychology from Durham University in England. Dr. Dutra's research focuses on the evolution and development of cooperation, cultural learning, and executive functions. Uh, she will speak to us about the promises of open science as an important pathway to globalization and diversification. Uh, Dr. Sutra and Dr. Basnight Brown were co-authors on a very important three-part series recently published by the APS on the globalization or the importance of globalization in psychological research. We'll then hear from Dr. Romina Garcia, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the Developmental Psycholinguistics Group of the University of Potsdam in Germany. Uh, Dr. Garcia is also a guest researcher at the Language Development Department of the Max Planck Institute of Psycholinguistics in the Netherlands. Her research focuses on figuring out how children endowed with the same neurobiology can learn the diversity of languages 
uh, in the world. And with Dr. Evan Kidd, Dr. Garcia has recently published an in-depth analysis of representation in language acquisition research, showing a very significant skew towards Western languages and particularly towards English. Dr. Garcia will speak to us about a recent initiative to diversify and globalize the study of early language acquisition. And then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Michael Frank, who is David and Lucille Packard Professor of Human Biology at Stanford University and Director of the Symbolic Systems Program. Dr. Frank studies language use and language learning, focusing particularly on early word learning and vocabulary development. He's founder of the Many Babies Consortium, which we'll discuss tonight. It's a collaborative replication network for infancy research, and Dr. Frank has also led open data projects, including Word Bank and Medala. Tonight, or today, Dr. Frank will share his work developing large and diverse data repositories and the scientific opportunities of scaling up science beyond individual laboratories. The format for this webinar is that each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have a brief uh, discussion uh, within the panel for about 15 minutes, and then we'll move to audience Q&A. So to start us off, we'll begin with Dr. Bobby Chan's presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Lahir. Just sharing my screen now. Okay. Great, um, thank you, Lahir, and um, also the SRCD for inviting me to participate in this webinar and uh, share some of the experiences that I've had as a researcher um, based in Singapore. And um, I'll be talking a bit about some of the, I guess what I refer to as some of the lived experiences and challenges that um, not just myself, but other colleagues that I've spoken with in Singapore, as well as other countries that may have been typically underrepresented in terms of um, the populations that they study uh, in, in psychological research. Um, I'll talk about how some of these experiences have motivated and informed the research that I've conducted on representation and inclusion in psychology. So um, I've conducted research in both the United States um, as a PhD student, um, and as well as through collaborations, ongoing collaborations with collab collaborators in the US um, but, but for the, nine, the last nine years or so, um, before recently returning to the US, I was based in Singapore um, at a university and also a research institute in Singapore where I had a fa faculty position. So one of the main differences between conducting psychological research in the US versus Singapore, of course, was the samples that I tested my research questions on. So even though I, I wasn't testing research questions that was always specific to Singaporean culture or society, the samples I recruited in my studies were almost entirely of Asian background. Now, when I uh, first began conducting research in Singapore, I didn't really think that this would matter much, but um, perhaps that was a bit naive. But as I began to publish more work or try to publish more work or present more of my work, I started to encounter some reactions from other members of the scientific com community that I had never really encountered when I had been doing research with an American sample. So I'll be talking a bit about some of these experiences um, and, and how uh, they may reflect a perception or bias of Americans as being a default sample and the challenges that this may pose for uh, researchers from underrepresented regions. So one discrepancy I encountered uh, when I was uh, seeking to publish work that I um, research I had conducted in Singapore was um, how journal editors and, um, uh, and reviewers may respond to the manuscripts that I submitted that involve Singaporean samples. So when I was working with American samples, there were never any was there never any controversy from journals about the fact that my sample was drawn from an American population. But with studies involving Singaporean samples, the fact that the research questions were tested on Singaporeans um, have actually been contributing factors to desk rejections at journals. So here's one example. It's a, an excerpt from a desk rejection that I received from a, a leading journal that's related to behavioral nutrition and, and eating behavior. So it wasn't specifically a psychology journal, but has um, some overlapping elements with um, psychological and behavioral science. So um, they indicate that the manuscript does indeed um, fail to meet some of the rigor required by the journal, but beyond some this kind of vague feedback, one explicit um, component of the decision to reject the manuscript was that the manuscript has limited relevance to the journal's largely US readership. Now, um, the study was on uh, the effect of stress on in some type of eating behavior. And there's not really anything controversial about this notion that um, stress may, um, the effect of stress on appetite or eating behavior may be just unique to some cultures. So um, 
there one challenge of, of, uh, from this experience was that um, my research may have been perceived as being somewhat too cultural or reflecting some narrow aspect of eating behavior that may be only applicable to Singaporeans when I was attempting to publish it in a journal that maybe uh, have a predominantly um, more general or, or predominantly American readership. So even when a manuscript I tried to submit pub passed um, a uh, editorial review and was sent out to reviewers, um, if this study involved a Singaporean sample, um, some of the comments I received from the reviewers uh, also were very different from the experience I had um, when dealing with reviewers for studies that involved American samples in the past. So one of the most common reviewer requests uh, that I had received is related to um, the request to explicitly qualify in the title um, so changing the title of the manuscript so that explicitly states that the research was done um, or found specifically on Singaporeans. So instead of just saying the effect of stress on appetite, it's effect of stress on appetite among Singaporeans. So that's fun in itself. Um, it's a practice to, intended to constrain the generalizability of research findings. But um, I, as well as none of my collaborators who had worked on research involving American samples have ever been suggested to do anything like this in the past. We've never been told to qualify that the finding was on uh, white American participants. So this suggests that there may be some disparities in the perceptions of how much findings are relevant or can be generalized to more broadly, uh, more broadly simply based on where the sample uh, came from. Um, another example is a um, tendency that uh, to request uh, researchers working with samples um, from, for instance, from Singapore to uh, collect new data or run a new study that involves a Western comparison sample, typically an American sample. So it's especially burdensome to expect researchers to collect new data for an experiment. Sometimes it's required. But in this case, they're being asked to, to do this um, so that their, their findings with a Singaporean sample can be put into the context of a more typical Western sample. And what this implies is that findings from a Singaporean sample may not really have intrinsic value. And instead, its value can really be measured by what it can tell us about a Western sample. So like any other social or psychological problem that I've um, in become personally interested in, I decided to do a study about this. So I wanted to test whether there may be disparities in how much the relevance or generalizability of findings from psychology studies are being constrained simply based on the country or the race or the cultural background of the study sample. So one way to do this is to check how frequently the origin or background of a study sample is being specified in titles of um, manuscripts simply based on the regions that they are they originate from. So as noted before, this is a practice that is um, intended to constrain the generalizability of a finding. It's a way to signal to the reader that a specific finding may be limited or specific to uh, a particular population that's um, indicated in the title. So I conducted an archival study on the frequency in which titles of published psychology articles from a wide range of, psycho uh, from a wide range of psycho psychology journals explicitly mention uh, sample origins um, based on whether the samples came from one of three regions. So the titles were coded for whether the sample um, that's specified in the title came from the USA. Um, we also had a coding for um, non-USA weird regions, so weird reflecting uh, Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic regions. So this second coding was for um, largely any weird region except the US, so included places like Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And finally, the, the final coding was focused on whether the sample was qualified um, and it originated from a, a non-weird region, so countries um, in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and so forth. So we ex extracted a sample of titles of published research articles from 49 psychology journals from 2004 to 2017, so over a span of 13 years. So specifically, we extracted any titles that made mention of race, ethnicity, nationality, or culture. Um, so again, specifying them in the title um, specifically with the purpose of indicating that, that this was the study sample or the population that was being studied. So after we coded um, whether extracted titles were specifically mentioning the race, ethnicity, nationality, and culture, uh, which I refer to with the acronym RANK, um, whether they were using these RANK characteristics to refer to sample origins, we ended up with a final list of 2,088 titles um, that fit this criteria. So um, here are the results. Um, among the articles that refer to rank characteristics to specify the sample origins in the title, we observed that samples from non-weird regions were qualified in titles uh, much more uh, than uh, any other region in the world. 
So this supports the argument that there may be a bias in which non-weird samples are perceived to have the most constrained generalizability or reflect some narrow niche pattern of human thought and behavior. So this uh, light gray bar here um, indicating uh, the non-weird samples, which again are qualified at higher frequencies than um, titles that qualify samples from other regions of the world. We also observed that samples from the USA were qualified the least frequently in titles compared to any other region, which also supports the argument that Americans may be especially perceived as a default sample uh, that may be especially reflective of humankind. So again, indicated here by the dark bars on the right, reflecting the lowest um, frequencies of um, sample of titles from that des describe participants from the US uh, being specified. When we examine these trends in the qualification of these characteristics of samples and titles over the 13 year period we investigated, we see that the practice of qualifying samples from both weird regions like Europe and non weird regions like Asia have been increasing over time, over this 13 year period. On the other hand, there's been virtually no change in the frequency of titles qualifying samples from the USA during the same time period, uh, with USA being um, this dark line at the bottom, which is largely flat. When we break these analyses down into journals that represent different subfields of psychology, we can see that these biases are more prevalent in some psychological subfields than others. Um, the black bars here represent frequency of titles qualifying samples from the USA, while the light bars represent frequency of titles qualifying samples from non-weird regions like Europe, and the dark gray bars represent uh, frequency of qualifying titles from non-weird non regions like, um, like Asia. Overall, we see that this bias in which American samples are treated as being context-free or as a default made by being qualified less than any other region are, uh, are most pronounced in journals that may focus on developmental and as well as clinical and health-related themes. These patterns suggest that how researchers study and think about human development may be especially vulnerable uh, to these types of sampling biases. Perhaps one consequence is the reinforcement of an assumption that the American experience of human de development is normative, while developmental experiences uh, of people in other regions may reflect some narrow niche aspect of the human experience. Overall, this archival study suggests um, the presence of a bias in psychological and behavioral science uh, that may assume samples drawn from the US are a prototype for or default for humankind more broadly, um, which also supports some of the lived experiences of not just myself, but uh, many other researchers who are um, trying to publish their work or doing research that involves samples from some of these underrepresented regions. So another uh, effect is that we observe is that um, so these types of under research or populations from these underrepresented regions may be perceived as being overly culture specific and non-generalizable to the broader human population. So these types of bias also have real world impacts for researchers and our science. There's some, also some more recent experimental meta research studies that suggest that researchers may discount the impact of studies um, or maybe less likely to cite papers if they were based on atypical or, or underrepresented samples. This directly affects citation counts and metrics used to gauge the productivity and impact of researchers who are based in these underrepresented regions. And as a result, these biases can also increase the risk of excluding a wide diversity of people and their experiences from the permanent scientific record. Now, there's some suggestions and ways that we can move forward to address these types of biases, um, but I look forward to discussing them uh, among the other panelists as well as in the Q&A session uh, of this webinar. So thank you all for your attention and just like to take a moment to thank uh, my collaborators here on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. We'll now move to Dr. Reiko Mazuka. Let me um, share my screen. Can people see the my slide? Sorry. Okay, so um, uh, I'm my name is Reiko Mazuka. I am actually quite surprised and pleased to hear uh, that what I was trying to talk about is have very similar experiences with uh, Bobby's. Um, so that um, I, after spending about 15 years at Duke University, I've opened up a lab in Japan at a place called Riken uh, Brain Science Institute. And uh, then I've been running a study, uh, primarily uh, testing uh, Japanese infants. And uh, so, the, so I'd like to just offer um, ideas and also the 
points for people to think about today um, about trying to run a study in uh, under underrepresented samples. And so that, say, Japan is uh, probably um, at least <laughs> definitely not West, but uh, not poor countries. Uh, but when I actually started, uh, tried to run experiments with um, Japanese population, uh, that there were um, sort of very similar uh, experiences that I had with um, uh, with the, what Bobby suggested. But it's not because the it's the US versus uh, Japan, but because the target language we study or the people I am working with uh, a learning uh, language that's not English. And so the, the first uh, constraints that I experienced that is early on, that this is before I, I actually opened a lab in Japan, is that there are um, uh, sort of requirements for people to do psycholinguistic experiment um, that are sort of a standard uh, used for English. So for example, when you're trying to run a study testing, say children learning um, as, you know, how children understand sentences and things like that, uh, that uh, depending on when you actually are trying to publish, there are uh, sort of factors that um, people have discovered over the years, uh, uh, primarily in English, that matters for you know, how you actually process it. So for example, you are, um, you know, you're trying to create a sentence and then the reviewers would say, okay, have you controlled for X, Y, and Z? So for example, the words, uh, what are the uh, word frequency in the corpus that, that, you know, children are likely to be hearing? And um, what are the conditional or co-occurrence co probability? Uh, probability? Um, so, or sometimes, uh, you know, we are trying to run uh, uh, studies and then, what's the, um, their vocabulary level? And so the, there are things that are available in the US at the time so that people who have started, you know, there are like nice, very large corpus to count word frequency. But at the time when I was trying to run it, there weren't really, uh, you know, available uh, a corpus that you cannot electronically count word frequencies or, uh, you know, co-occurrence probabilities. And then on that base, then the reviewers were saying, well, your results isn't valid. So that was all, all, that was one of those um, you know, uh, big challenges. And it took you know, like 20 years, I guess, over the years in, in Japan at least, uh, to come for people, I guess, in the broad field to prepare uh, these materials. But this is a big hurdle for uh, people who are trying to you know, open up a research in the new domain or new language uh, that every time you're trying to submit something and it, you know, ask to um, uh, provide, uh, you know, those data that's just not available. And then a single person trying to do one experiment just doesn't have the resources to build a new corpus to count, do the word counts. And so that actually gives the uh, um, entry level uh, difficulty. So the, there are also um, uh, challenges in setting up labs um, in, say, uh, in, a, in a country or in the environment where the, the kind of research is not very um, common. So the, um, when I, it took, it, it was a big challenge to move to Japan and try to open a lab to test uh, babies because the, say there are, a lot of difficulties. And the first of all, that um, the lab to test like young babies, uh, you know, requires mothers to be bringing their mothers or caretakers to bring their baby to the lab. Uh, but there are, um, depending if you haven't done this and people have never heard of it, then it is not uh, easy to convince uh, the people who are you know, the mothers or say the people who are at the health departments or the city office who may actually be, um, you know, letting you recruit babies from, uh, you know, we need to be really, uh, it, it's not always the case that, you know, well, this is something we would love to do. I mean, you, you have to do the work of convincing them. Um, so also in Japan, at least, that say psychology and linguistics are qualified, I guess, classified as a, a humanities. And if you are a faculty uh, in the humanity department, that say lab spaces and other resources to go along with it is, is not 
something that the uh, you you know the department sort of uh, take assumes that's necessary. Uh, so that if a young person coming in asks for a lab space that's bigger than the full professors, then that's not going to go easy, e taking, you know, be acceptable very easily. And also that uh, along the same line that it is difficult to obtain the kind of funding that's necessary because that say, um, a lot of the times the reviews for the grants are done within the, uh, the say, I guess, classification that you are doing humanities versus you know, uh, sciences and engineering, and that uh, the total um, money available to be divided by the, all the humanity faculties are not big. So if you actually want to run uh, a lab to run a baby, it takes a lot of work and a lot of people. And so it, it's just getting grants just not uh, very easy. So I guess the, the third and then the last of the challenges is very similar to what uh, Bobby was saying, that um, when uh, we were uh, trying to submit a journal, uh, I guess it's generally speaking, it's a lot easier to um, publish a paper when I am studying something that's uh, very unique to Japanese. So there are lexical pitch accents and vowel duration differences and all those things that that's kind of, uh, People could see that uh, that you know whether the, the babies acquire uh, these features in a sort of similar way versus uh, differently compared to say what's familiar about say English babies, but um, oftentimes because of that uh, that uh, we are always asked to justify uh, that you know like it's important to study Japanese because these features don't exist in English and therefore you should actually, you know, at least send it to the review. And so the underlying question is very, very obviously that uh, couldn't you have done it uh, with a better language, you know, with a sort of a language that we know a bit better, namely English or I say other European languages. And uh, so also that uh, we are often asked to uh, qualify the generalizability of the results. So that um, I have built a corpus of infant directed speech in Japan and uh, the, in, on, with the Japanese mothers. And uh, we have uh, uh, what I guess that what's pretty unique among, among the uh, corpus of uh, infant directed speech that we have a coding for the prosody. So there are a lot of things we, can, we can't do without the prosodic coding. So I've been uh, collaborating with a lot of different people, so primarily uh, many of, of whom are from uh, France. So that we are trying to, uh, run, we, you know, we run analyses using the prosodic boundaries and then we try to publish it. And then every single time, it, the latest one just came out in two, 2022, we are asked to, um, sort of justify that, okay, you have done this study in Japanese. Um, how, how can you uh, sort of show that, that this results would apply to, you know, to a language acquisition in general? And the, the question is, we don't know because ours is the only corpus that has these codings. And, but we, after, for, after a couple of times we had we have done this that you know we we did our best to sort of say okay you know these are comparable to English uh, existing results and then da, da, da. but uh, you know every single time when we get asked we are beginning to get kind of angry <laughs> at the reviewers and uh, uh, for asking exactly the same question even though the, I'm sure the reviewers are uh, different from uh, previous ones. So that the question really is, would the results generalize beyond uh, Japanese that, you know, like this is just sort of peculiar? Or I say, um, is it um, uh, that, that is the finding that you actually uh, found uh, should be sort of said, that, okay, you, the author, please be aware that what you have read, uh, read it may be limited to uh, Japanese. So these are the uh, kinds of um, qualifications and uh, that we are asked to do, and we often wonder that you know, 
I have never been asked to say these things if uh, when I, I looked at uh, English. And so that um, the among the Bobby's uh, bar graph, the one area that the uh, qualification didn't seem to be asked were the cognitive um, uh, studies. And, uh, but I guess uh, language linguistics, uh, language um, studies often are, I guess the kind of question I've been asking are the uh, ones um, in and that cognitive development. But uh, even within the cognitive development, when you are asked, uh, when you are running uh, language studies, uh, something very similar is happening. And then it's something that uh, organization like this or that webinar like this, uh, I hope uh, will actually help people to appreciate the, uh, these things that uh, we experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reiko. We'll now move to Dr. Dana Basnight Brown. Can everyone hear me now? Yes, okay. Um, so I am Dana Bassnight Brown, and as was mentioned in the introduction um, today, I have resided in Nairobi, Kenya for the last 10 years. Uh, much of my research background is in multilingualism and particularly in how multilingual communities, uh, children and adults uh, use and acquire their languages, often within the context of emotion processing. Whoops, just turning my video on. Okay, hopefully that is good. Um, so I wanted to share today a little bit about some of the challenges and the advantages and the challenges in setting up a lab, conducting basic research uh, in the East African setting. So a lot of this is shaped by my own personal experiences um, in doing these activities in this area, as well as a lot of the insights um, in hearing from my students and some of the challenges that they face. And you'll probably see that after having just heard from Ryko, um, there's a lot of similarities in some of the things I will mention, which I think is really nice because it shows us that these are commonalities in very different geographic regions and different parts of the globe. So uh, I think that's a theme that you'll probably hear a bit in this webinar today. So what are some of the uh, advantages uh, to conducting research in perhaps a less represented region? So one of the ones that has really struck me, um, and I think it's one of the obvious ones, probably why many of us are here today, but it is a better understanding of human behavior by having more diverse samples. So I think many of us would agree that psychological science, the study of human development has been too constrained for far too long in that so many of the prominent theories uh, surrounding human behavior, human cognition, uh, are based on findings from a really small slice of the human population. So here's a quote I'll just share from one of my students who said, you know, we always complain that reading materials do not give relevant examples from an African context. So we need to start creating such materials and research plays a huge role in this. This is a constant challenge a lot of my students face, even though our institution tries to get international textbooks, they're really not international at all. And the research my students are reading about is very different in terms of the issues that are um, of most interest in the region. So I just wanted to share those that students exact words um, so you could hear their voice as well. A second issue is the opportunity to gain new insights from your collaborators in these other locations, uh, perhaps these less represented um, regions. So this is another one I have found to be extremely important because when you're working with collaborators in these other areas, um, this can expand not only your understanding of how research may be done differently, but it could even reframe the goals of the research project. So for example, here in, um, in my location in East Africa, a lot of emphasis is on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And researchers therefore really have to consider this in their, when creating a research topic, this is something that's usually at the forefront of many of my students' you know, mind when they are thinking about a thesis or dissertation project. 
And depending on the location, it could even affect whether IRB approval is granted or not for a specific project. So I have witnessed um, at several institutions, my own being one of them, which stress that research, and this is a direct quote uh, from my university in their handbook, handbook, which states that research must be guided by humanitarian and equity-based concerns, not by the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. And I just think that's a really powerful statement because it tells us that research projects have to have some sort of community benefit here. And I think this is actually, a, well, it is a good thing, but on top of that, it can get researchers who are not used to working in those areas to think outside the box or to more carefully consider how a certain research project could truly benefit a population. And then a third point I will mention here is, um, I don't know why this is not advancing is greater awareness to open science research practices. I have witnessed, as compared to my experience in the West, that there is more openness to publishing open access or using open science practices. In developing country contexts, uh, this is likely out of necessity. Institutions do not have funds to subscribe to uh, journals that are behind, behind very expensive paywalls. So there's going to be a lot of openness to publishing in these um, open access journals. In Ethiopia, for example, in 2019, they developed an open access policy, which said that all federally funded research in that country had to be open access. And they were the first on the continent to do so. And I think that's a, this is a topic we'll be hearing about a little bit later in this webinar as well um, from Dr. Frank, I believe. So those are just three of the advantages and opportunities that have been very prominent in my experience. There are many more, but I just wanted to touch on a few today. Next, I will shift a little bit to some of the challenges that I have faced. And one of those is ethics approval. IRB processes could be very different depending on the country. In some African countries, there are no IRBs. They do not exist right now. In others, it can be a very costly, um, monetarily expensive endeavor. And it also could be time consuming more so than maybe what some are used to because the processes are just a bit different. There's also uh, sort of as, as uh, Reiko had mentioned, minimal infrastructure, space, resources is a really, really big problem. I will not get into this for the sake of time, but that is something I could expand on a lot um, if anyone was interested. Funding is another big one. I believe Natalia is going to speak more to this as well, but in Africa, for example, governments still only marginally uh, fund research and development. So as of just two years ago, Africa's R&D funding was only 0.42% of GDP. And for reference, you know, global the global average is around 1.7%. Another issue, that I have faced a lot is the perception of psychology as a science. So psychological science is not really a term that you would find used here. This obviously has implications for basic research. So in terms of whether it is even a priority, um, the emphasis in psychology in the region where I reside is often on counseling and clinical work which I have to say is really important in the region. Uh, we really need more mental health practitioners as an actual scientific discipline, okay? And finally, um, one of the challenges I wanted to mention was differences in expectation and communication. So one of the reasons I think it's really important to sit down with your local collaborators and sort of discuss some of these things early on is because the Goals in mind might be very different. Um, for one group, it could possibly be the, you know, in some sort of intervention or a program or innovation, while for another group, their motive could be more so focused on getting graduate students or even undergrads involved in research. And so I think that it's really important to look at the local researchers you're working with and sort of 
talk through early on what are the expectations for each and what are the priorities going to be. And that might seem obvious, but I think you would be surprised at how infrequently that is sometimes done or not just not done well. So given these challenges, um, I have found it takes a certain level of sort of perseverance and determination to sometimes have a successful research program in a location where you maybe don't have access to as many resources as maybe you have experienced in, in the past, or maybe you have never had access to. Um, and that can be a big challenge to conducting basic research. But one of the things that's really encouraged me is I have found that for myself, as well as my colleagues in these various areas, we have to be much more creative and resourceful. But if you're up to the challenge, I find that the research can be so much more rewarding and have a really big impact. So that is something I always come back to um, at times when maybe things take a level of you know, perseverance that maybe um, I wasn't used to when I've done research in other parts of the world. So just to conclude, it's been suggested that how we do science is going to change more in the next 20 years uh, than it has in the past 300 years. Now, I guess time will tell us if this actually occurs or not, but I really do think we're in a very exciting time uh, in the globalization of the research landscape, even though there is, of course, still a lot of work to be done. And for this reason, I really believe that working in highly collaborative international teams alongside researchers in underrepresented areas um, is only going to increase in the years to come. And I think we will all be better for it. We will be better for it as researchers as well as our science. So thank you. Thank you, Dana. We'll now move to Natalia Dutra. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about open science as a means for global diversity in developmental psychology. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, Dana said a lot of the things that I want to say much better than I could. I'm a developmental psychologist, so I worked, uh, I've been working in uh, global teams, uh, both within and outside uh, developmental psychology. Uh, and I want to use a Brazilian case study to illustrate a couple of points. Uh, and I'm going to talk about open science and the illusion of a li linear progress and open science is a means for global diversity in developmental psychology. The case study I'm going to talk about is um, a paper that was published in 2011 in Brazil, in a Brazilian journal um, that was titled The Environment of, Environment of Development and the Start of Brazilian uh, Women's Reproductive Life. Uh, this was a paper published uh, by Lordello and collaborators. They had a fairly big uh, sample size of 606 women in six Brazilian states. Yeah, it's true. Uh, and eight um, authors, seven women from these states. And it was published in Portuguese. And in this study, they found that part of their data, uh, that data, that data didn't, didn't support an important hypothesis. Uh, from life history theory at the time. They concluded that uh, diversity of life conditions, I uh, can read it, in Brazil, <laughs> offers alternative contexts to hypothesis testing. Uh, in 2019, a review uh, found that cross-cultural evidence does not support uh, universal acceleration of puberty in father absent households, that it was exactly the hypothesis that Lodelo and collaborators also didn't find any support in Brazil. Four, and there is no mention of uh, Lodelo's and collaborators' work in that review, and probably the, the work of other people, I'm assuming. And uh, that happened because only papers published in English were considered for the review. That was acknowledged by the authors, uh, by the way, as a limitation. And uh, as you could see from uh, the previous talks, uh, and I can actually offer all the evidence for that in the Q&A 
is that happens almost everywhere in psychology, uh, whether we um, don't really have, um, we don't see actually the contributions of other researchers uh, from uh, outside some specific countries or some specific research communities. Uh, when we look at English speaking journals uh, in 2017, uh, Newsom and collaborators found that in child development, developmental psychology, and developmental science from 2006 to 2010, uh, less than 3% of samples came from countries in Central and South America, and Africa, Asia, and the Middle East and Israel. And uh, the first authors, uh, for the first authors, for, uh, about 4% of institutions came from institutions in Asia and Israel and Central South America, and none of, none of them had the first author located in the Middle East or Africa. Um, hold that thought for a bit. Then I, I would like to talk a little bit about open science as a promise to increase global diversity. So open science is um, a set of principles and behaviors that promote transparent, credible, reproducible, and accessible science. It's an umbrella term for uh, several practices that includes uh, publishing in open access uh, journals, but also sharing your data, publishing preprints, uh, conducting massive online open courses, uh, and also conducting uh, citizen science. So it includes a lot of uh, practices. And I wanted to uh, highlight the premise that open science is a major movement. We believe, uh, we tend to believe that it's, um, it's something that is happening in a large scale. I'm not sure if it is, maybe it is. But Syed and Katawala, they warned us uh, that the awareness, acceptance, and implementation of open science is uneven across the sciences broadly and across subfields within psychology. And we can even say also uh, between and within uh, regions and within communities. So we should be aware uh, uh, of the illusion of a linear progress as well. So instead of thinking that everyone is going towards a better, um, a better, uh, sorry, I'm, I opened the chat and the chat is now like, In the middle of my uh, screen. So we think about this linear progress and I wanted to go back to the case study that I was talking about and uh, that paper was published in the Brazilian journal um, and at the time and at the time it was published in Portuguese and uh, you didn't pay anything to submit for that journal. Now it's sponsored by Springer and uh, from six, 2016 onwards uh, there are APC fees to submit uh, to publish that, and uh, we as Latin America researchers get a 50% discount in my own country. And currently, they only accept manuscripts in English. Um, then, uh, so I wanted to use that to highlight that sometimes uh, we think that we're progressing, but the, the open science discourse can be used for profit by other players. And also uh, Brazil and Latin America had still have a great um, and outstanding uh, initiative in open access, which is one of the practices of open science and is getting a bit like corrupted by the interest of academic publishers, for example. Uh, about open sciences, it means um, to promote uh, global diversity. For promoting global diversity in developmental psychology, I just wanted to highlight a point. Uh, we are all talking about uh, uh, several aspects of that, but I like to highlight the role of funds in agencies. I had a very unpleasant experience I, uh, recently where I was in a workshop and then I asked a representative of a funding agency whether uh, about why they didn't have a fellow from a developing country. And the person uh, replied to me that none of the candidates from these places, I don't know how many applied for it, none of them uh, reached, the, reached the quality threshold for uh, moving forward and then being able to uh, get the fellowship. And they can only consider diversity to provide those fellowships. Um, and back to my case study, uh, when that study happened, so you have a national study with 
academic, Brazilian academic researchers who are still, most of them are still doing research and supervising students in Brazil. They have this national research network and then uh, produced a, a very good paper in our country. So that was due to um, an increase in uh, national funding for research networks. And we had several cuts over the past few years, and that is affecting, of course, these research networks. They are struggling right now. But I wanted to highlight what happens when we actually provide an opportunity for people to conduct um, uh, research uh, in large scale. When they, you, have, you provide them with money, of course. So Sandionia uh, alert us to in include uh, different kinds of voices in trying to find a solution for open science. That includes open science and developmental psychology. And I wanted to highlight uh, just a couple of examples how we can do that. So I was part of a team that got uh, recently got a small grant to improve uh, psychological science. Is a team of women. Came, we come from different countries. Uh, all of them are from the global south in some ways, uh, uh, different kinds of countries. And we, one of the things that we, we want to do is to provide materials and talks, or at least the captions, in multiple languages, uh, in uh, workshops to train uh, researchers from developing countries in on big team science. And the last example I have is actually uh, a grant that is, uh, we don't have the final uh, results already, uh, but um, the, this grant, they tried, in this grant, they're trying to address diversity and inclusion uh, through the whole, uh, for various steps through the, um, the selection process, adding training and mentoring for those who are applying for the money. Uh, so we can actually go beyond the quality threshold narrative uh, I wanted to highlight that global diversity is only one of multiple layers that we have to think about when we're talking about global diversity of developmental psychology. And to end, I just wanted to say that there are no simple solutions for complex issues, and we must think beyond uh, individualistic approach to solving these issues, and uh, we should favor a relational one where we can actually uh, have uh, collaboration between different people and teams, uh, hopefully with funding to uh, get to the end that we aim, we aim to achieve. Thanks a lot. Obrigada. Thank you, Natalia. We'll now move to Dr. Rowena Garcia. Thank you. Just a second, I will share my screen. I hope you can see it now. Perfect. So hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'll talk about our experience from organizing the L Plus Truly Global Summer Winter School a free five-day online event targeting students at all levels and early career researchers from all regions, but particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia, and South and Central America. So this all started because of the observation that most of our knowledge on child development come from participants in the USA um, or English-speaking countries or other European countries. In fact, excluding studies on non-human participants or those that did not report uh, the origin of their participants, we see that 93% of published studies in leading developmental journals investigated participants in these countries. And a similar finding was reported for infant studies in particular. So this is related to Bobby's Americans as the default sample. And this is despite the fact that we have evidence for cross-cultural variation in many aspects of child development. And we believe that this over-reliance on a narrow sample pool is problematic for data interpretation, theory building, and forming generalizations. In language acquisition in particular, we do not see much difference. Most of our knowledge also come from studies on English and other Indo-European languages. In fact, only 
1.7% of the 7,000 languages of the world have been investigated at least once in terms of acquisition. So this bias toward English and other Indo-European languages means that they are taken as the prototype for language acquisition, even though we know that the languages of the world show a remarkable amount of diversity. So just like in developmental research in general, this has no doubt skewed theoretical development. That's why it's very important for us to have more research on understudied languages. And from L+, we thought in general, one thing that can help uh, to achieve this is to give students in underrepresented populations access to what is typically only would be limited to students from rich countries or students who have funding to pay for a conference or travel to a conference. So that was just the idea at the start. But it's through our diverse organization team and discussions with our colleagues that we were able to identify the specific barriers to inclusion and what our summer school can address. So the L plus team was made up of 26 volunteer researchers with 18 of us originally from underrepresented countries. So you can see in the map we are, where we're from. So our diversity allowed us to think of all the possible ways to make our event inclusive, which was a consideration in each step. We also saw the benefits of encouraging junior researchers or those from underrepresented areas to be the leaders of different tasks or sub teams. So from our discussions, we found that in our target areas, um, developmental science programs were not really accessible. So students lacked uh, basic knowledge of research design and the theoretical foundations. They also did not have access to the literature. And if they do, most of the time, this was difficult to apply in their context, as also mentioned by Dana um, before. Additionally, there's also a lack of access to hardware and software, which can be used uh, for research. So from these, we decided that our summer school uh, should include lectures targeting entry level theoretical knowledge and the basics of research design. When possible, we also focus on simpler research methods, which our students can easily conduct given less resources. We also included live discussions to try to put the lectures into the context of our participants. It helped that we had 70 researchers from 28 countries who volunteered as lecturers, discussants, and assistants. Additionally, we offered practical sessions focusing on open source materials, which our students can easily use. So ranging from programming experiments, designing questionnaires, and up to statistical analysis. Other barriers include uh, lack of financial resources uh, and training. So this has also been mentioned in the previous um, presentations. In L+, we might not have been able to provide grants, but we aim to build lasting ties with international researchers to promote collaboration. So we had networking and opportunity sessions. And we really invited those who have scholarships and internships to offer. So we designed uh, these sessions for L plus to be more than just a one week event. To promote inclusivity during the school, we employed asynchronous and synchronous elements. So for the asynchronous uh, part, we had the pre-recorded lectures, so they were available earlier on. For the synchronous, we had live discussions, uh, networking events, opportunity sessions across three time zones. Additionally, uh, we provided closed captions for the lectures and international sign interpretation for the live sessions. We also issued a code of conduct, so reminders on what might be offensive in other cultures and of zero tolerance for harassment. To optimize the discussions for each time zone, we limited participation in the synchronous events to 100 attendees. 
So we gave priority to those from traditionally underrepresented regions and we maximized uh, the number of countries represented. You can see in the map uh, where our students were from. Uh, we were really glad to have such a diverse group. To show a comparison to participants in other workshops, our co-organizer Alex Christia has generously shared data with us from a hybrid workshop they organized in 2015. And we can see here how different that distribution is. So we can see we really have more from this side of the globe. Going back to L plus now, those who did not get accepted were actually still given access to the pre-recorded lectures. So hopefully we were able to help uh, most of our 958 applicants in one way or another. We also noticed that we got the highest number of applicants in places where we had a local team member. So this really shows the importance of having a diverse uh, team. Overall, the feedback from the students showed that it was a success, um, but definitely there are remaining challenges. Um, one was poor internet connection for uh, some of our students. And this made it uh, hard for them to participate uh, all throughout. So um, we're thinking now that for future editions of the L Plus Summer School, um, that we can consider handing out uh, internet subscription grants, much like travel grants in other conferences. Additionally, um, the highly diverse educational levels and fields of our students so these en enriched the discussions, but also made it difficult to address everybody's needs. So maybe in the future, we'll think about streamlining our program. Moreover, uh, it really took us, it really took uh, much time for us to organize the school, especially given the three time zones, although this was very uh, welcome by our st students. Thankfully, uh, many of our students from this uh, edition indicated interest in helping in future editions of L+. Um, and we are also now considering randomly assigning registrants to synchronic events to minimize time and people intensive components of organizing the school. Lastly, we will aim for greater geographic diversity among our lecturers and greater customization of contents to the participants' context. Although much remains to be done to promote inclusivity in developmental research, we hope that our summer school will contribute to empowering researchers to investigate and publish on language acquisition in their home languages and developmental research in their local populations. I would like to thank um, the whole L Plus organization team, our funders, and our volunteer lecturers, discussants, and assistants, the SRCD for inviting us. Here are our references. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Rowena. We'll now move to Dr. Mike Frank. Okay, thanks Lahair, and thank you to all of the other panelists. This has been very interesting thus far. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about how global open collaboration can lead us to scientific opportunities, echoing many of the themes that you've heard in the talks before mine. So the specific question that I want to focus on is whether we can use open science practices to create a more diverse global science of child development. And in particular, I'm gonna be zooming in on two examples from the study of language development, trying to use these to illustrate the broader point that open science practices can help us advance our science by broadening global participation. As I probably don't have to remind you, across countries, contexts, and cultures, children rapidly learn the language or languages that they're exposed to. This learning is one 
critical part of the transformation that children undergo as they transition from being speechless, wordless infants to just a few years later, toddlers that can use language to become part of a cultural community. This is both a scientific question. It's also a question of immense practical interest. How, they do, how do they do this? So the modern project of studying language and language development began with this promise of uncovering the universal aspects of language development by looking at the particulars of language structure and language acquisition across different communities and different languages. But with the rise of experimental psycholinguistics, you get a corpus of work that's by necessity, just because of practical concerns, centered around a small number of labs in a small set of locations. Of course, we know what happens next, fast forward, uh, 50 years, and what we end up with a, is a set of homogenous developmental participant populations, as nicely documented in the study uh, by Kidd and Dr. Garcia that was just presented. From my perspective, this is a real missed scientific opportunity. Yet, this is not a description of the entire field, and there are some prominent efforts to recognize the role of cross-linguistic data and to make it possible for us to reason about acquisition across contexts. It's important to acknowledge these early models. The first and maybe most prominent is the, is the child language data exchange system or CHILDS. Uh, this is an open repository that's really paved the way for data sharing in the field of child language and far beyond. Since long before big data was a buzzword, the CHILDS archive has been allowing the free and open sharing of language data from many different children, populations, and languages. In addition, the pioneering work of Dan Slobin and his collaborators on the cross-linguistic study of language acquisition provides a model for carrying out systematic investigations across many different contexts and languages. So my question is, how do we follow these examples? And uh, following on the suggestions of Dr. Basnight Brown and Dr. Dutra, I think you really see that open science practices can be a big part of uh, encouraging this kind of global collaboration. So let me show you two examples that highlight some of the principles that I think uh, we can follow here. The first is building a global science through data sharing. So this is an example that focuses on an instrument called the MacArthur Bates Communicative Development Inventory, which is a mouthful. So it's called the CDI. CDIs are a simple parent report bubble sheet that allows parents to report on the words that their children produce. So for example, you bubble in if your child says alligator or duck or wolf or zebra and so on for more than 600 words in some versions of the form. Surprisingly, perhaps, the CDI forms are both reliable and valid, and they're also very inexpensive to administer. That means that they are very useful as a first screening tool or as a research tool, and as a result, CDI forms now have been adapted for more than 100 languages around the world. Some of these adaptations have been used extensively. Uh, and they have normative data sets associated with them. So that creates a real opportunity because of the depth of data on CDIs for languages around the world. Try to take advantage of this opportunity, my collaborators and I created a site called WordBank, which is an open database of MacArthur CDI results from many languages around the world. WordBank now contains data from more than 75,000 children and 29 languages or dialects. In fact, we're about to do a major upgrade and add another six or seven languages. Uh, so we're really uh, beginning to get a broader, if not representative sample of the world's languages. Critically, WordBank is enabled by sharing norms that are evolving. So because WordBank shares all data openly, we really try to encourage a culture of appropriate sharing and acknowledgement. So we have strong citation norms based on the norms from Childis. And we really try to use WordBank as a way to give prominence to the contributions of CDI researchers all over the world. Putting all these data together in a uniform format with a uniform interface to access them also creates an opportunity. My collaborators and I have been able to take a variety of different phenomena in child language acquisition, especially in vocabulary learning, analyze those across the languages available in WordBank, and then look at the relative consistency of these phenomena across languages. The result is our book, Variability and Consistency in Early Language Learning, the WordBank Project, which I encourage you to check out. It's freely available on uh, the Stanford website that you see here.
So this is just one example of the many ways that researchers have made use of this open resource to try to pursue their own research agendas around understanding early language learning. The second example I want to tell you about is building a global science through collaboration, trying to engage collaborators worldwide to contribute to a shared joint data collection project. And this is through Many Babies, which is a collaborative project for replication and best practices in developmental psych, focusing specifically on infancy. Now, when we were beginning talking about many babies, we started by thinking about wanting to measure variability in a single experimental phenomenon across labs and across contexts. As a first case study, we decided on the well-known phenomenon of infant's preference for infant-directed speech over adult-directed speech. There are many findings in the literature that report this a preference, and so it was perfect for a first collaborative replication. We then devised a flexible experimental paradigm, which could be implemented in a variety of different ways. Basically, we measured babies looking at an uninformative visual stimulus when it was paired with either infant-directed or adult-directed speech. We put out a call for participation, hoping that we would get five or 10 labs, and we would be able to analyze variability in some way across them. So we were incredibly overwhelmed when at the end of a year of data collection, we had data from 69 labs, 17 countries, and four continents. With 2,700 babies in our initial sample, we think this is one of the largest experimental studies of infant development that's been done. And the results were very interesting. So what you see here is a meta-analytic plot of the average effect size from each of the participating labs and each of the samples they contributed across three different methods. We saw a reliable effect of infant-directed speech preference. So this phenomenon did in fact replicate in our hands, uh, but we also measured variation across children's ages and culture and language background. Further, there were some interesting methodological generalizations that fell out that can guide future research to be more effective and efficient in gathering data from infants. Finally, and I think this is a very optimistic uh, conclusion of the study, is that there were no big hidden moderators in our data. Rather, the variation we observed appeared to be due to small samples in individual labs, suggesting that this kind of collaboration really could hold the promise of providing more stable and more precise estimates of some important quantities that we're interested in in early language development. So many babies, one focused on language, as did World Bank, but I believe these open science principles are applicable well beyond language development. In fact, the Many Babies collaboration has expanded much beyond infant-directed speech preference. Many Babies 2 is about to start data collection on infant's theory of mind. Many Babies 3 is in a similar stage looking at infant's rule learning. And there are many other Many Babies projects, including up to Many Babies 6, which is about to be approved for neonatal imitation. So we're really trying to use this collaborative approach to study a variety of phenomena across different uh, cultures and labs. In addition, the data sharing uh, approach also is, is one that we think is widely extensible. So Databrary allows the sharing of video data and the aggregation of such data across cultures and contexts. And MetaLab is a tool that we've been building to look at meta-analyses, trying to aggregate experimental effects and have researchers contribute some of their uh, meta-analytic estimates from their experiments so that we can better estimate key phenomena across labs. So summing up here, uh, I think understanding variation and its flip side consistency is a key theoretical goal, not just for language development, for, but for development more generally. And this goal relies on a global science of child development. We simply can't do the science we want without a more inclusive and global culture in our field. I believe that open science practices that encourage data sharing and collaboration can create the kinds of opportunities for uh, advancing our science that I've tried to talk, talk about here. In other words, from both a scientific perspective and an ethical perspective, our incentives are aligned. Broadening participation is simply the right thing to do. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mike. And I wanted to thank all of the speakers for a really interesting set of very thought provoking talks. Um, lots to think about. And in light of the time, I think we'll have a brief uh, group discussion and then move on to the question and answer session. So I just wanted to mention it for the audience. If you have questions, please type them into the question and answer box and we'll bring up those questions for the group to discuss. 
So I wanted to pick up on sort of the global, um, our global priorities as we diversify our science. And I think we're really talking about a long arc of change. But for the individual researcher who wants to break out of their laboratory and diversify their own studies, perhaps an early career researcher or somebody that doesn't have the sort of a vast wealth of resources, do you have any advice or any strategies for such a person? Well, uh, I would I would say that I, you know I think that um, one of the pieces of advice that I give to early career researchers in many contexts is to pursue your interests through a kind of diverse research portfolio or a broad research portfolio. That is, you can have a uh, an interest that you pursue locally, uh, and you can also broaden your network by contributing to projects in a variety of ways. So one of the things that we've tried to do in many babies is to create participation opportunities at different levels. Some uh, people participate by collecting data, others participate by being involved in stimulus creation or writing or analysis. And these uh, opportunities, some of them extend temporarily, others are kind of short and intense. So we try to make different niches for people to contribute. And I think that I, I wouldn't say that necessarily somebody should spend all of their time on collaborative projects. It's, it is important to gain the experience of leading a project and uh, having that research independence of really thinking through the ideas yourself. But adding collaborative projects can broaden your network and can really uh, help you learn new techniques that you then bring back to your own specific research program. Thank you, Natalia, and then Dana. Uh, yeah, I agree with Frank, uh, Michael, sorry, Dr. Frank, actually he called me Dr. Dutra. Um, uh, I think um, if someone comes from uh, place with uh, from a low resource uh, low, low resource lab um, join collaborative projects uh, projects is is very helpful I think I learned a lot from working on PSA uh, projects and not by coll only collecting data for example because sometimes you won't perhaps have the resources to do that, but you can learn for, from reviewing papers, from learning how people apply to grants, more specifically. I learned a lot uh, from more experienced and um, people from developed countries, especially USA, about how you can actually write uh, for grant applications. Uh, we are trying to do that with our grants, actually, uh, mini grants, uh, teach other people how they can actually apply for more money. Uh, from uh, people from developing countries. So we can actually learn a lot from joining a team. Thank you. Dana? Yeah, I was just going to add to that, um, not just trying to plug the Psychological Science Accelerator, but um, many babies and a lot of these team science initiatives that, you know, are really growing rapidly in interest. Um, I think joining one of those kinds of projects based on where your area of research best fits is, I think, a great starting point. Um, and it is important to still develop like your own sort of portfolio of research. But I think one of the advantages of these networks is at the PSA, for example, like we're all, right now, we're actively looking to um, diversify the ty types of project proposals we get. So we're wanting to get proposals that aren't just coming from, you know, replicating Western context, but getting actually people from less represented areas submitting those proposals. Um, but the other nice thing is just by becoming a member, it's free to do so. So that is a good incentive. Um, and you can join a committee. You can see which areas are most interested. But you you might find even two or three people that you're interested in doing, like completely unrelated to PSA. But just by being a member of one of these networks, you might be connected with two or three researchers that you then go and do your own individualized project with, because not all proposals can be accepted as a PSA project, but we've had a lot of people connect in that way. And I think then you can also develop your own research program, as well as contributing to like these larger team science projects. You can almost do both um, simultaneously. And I think another thing is, is mentorship. Like we're looking at the PSA to develop some mentorship programs for people who want to get skills in project management and things like that. So that is another, I think, incentive to look at many babies PSA and 
there's so many, many, many out there now. So just exploring some of those. Thank you, Bobby. Um, yes. So in regards to uh, especially early career researchers who may not have a lot of uh, opportunities or resources, uh, um, I think so, you know the old-fashioned way of also networking is also it would be helpful for establishing these types of collaborations, like um, meeting up with somebody or identifying people that attend um, a conference that you're at that may be from a region of the world that you want to target, and establishing networking with them to develop um, common interests, collaboration, and so forth. But um, there's some structural constraints that actually that sounds pretty pretty um, obvious, but there's structural constraints that go against that, and part of that is because it's so difficult from, for people from, especially these really underrepresented low-income uh, regions of the world to, um, uh, to come and, to such international meetings, especially if they're largely held in, uh, in North America or, or just in Europe. And so um, it does, there is that challenge there, there as well. And, and even when they do come, um, some experiences of people who are coming from underrepresented regions to these conferences, you know, it could be especially overwhelming that, um, you know, for us, uh, uh, in based in the U.S., um, you know, our whole department or our colleagues might might go together to the conference. We're all together. But if you're coming from a region, um, you have to travel across the world 20 plus hours to get to this conference that's always held in um, this one continent. And you might be the only person from your institute that comes. And so even if you if you are able to come, it may be um, it may seem very insular and very difficult um, psychologically to kind of reach out and connect with people. So I think having some ways to facilitate participation, as well as um, um, not just inviting and having people come, but once they do come, having ways to better include them into the activities and conferences for networking to, to generate these types of uh, collaborative opportunities for our early career researchers would be uh, really helpful. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, Rico and then Rowena. The, um, my experience in, with Japanese researchers may be a slightly different from yours, but I basically tell them, you really need to learn how to speak English because the Japan is large enough as a scientific community that you can actually survive, you know, as a sort of established researchers, not even, you know, writing a paper in English at all. But, you know, all the people who are here are here because they understand, you know, English. So, but there are so many people who just, wh whose English level isn't there. So that, you know, the international collaborative approach just is not, you know, within their realm. But uh, so I guess the very first step I tell my uh, young scholars is that there are just so much out there that you can learn and gain by accessing the, these network of international researchers. Uh, don't just stay within, but it's not that easy for some, some of the uh, people, I guess the, um, uh, the, you know, the Portuguese and uh, 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 Spanish, uh, populations also have the similar kind of thing. So that's that's something that I try to tell everybody. Okay. Thank you, Rowena. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, that from my experience, what really helped even from my master's uh, time was to identify what is special in my native language. So my research now is typically on uh, focusing on the typologically unique features of my native language Tagalog since it can tease apart predictions of um, theories. So that helped. And I wanna follow up on what Bobby said regarding conferences. That's also how I got my, uh, I think it helped in me getting my postdoc for example. Um, but of course that was also pre pandemic time. And indeed, like what Bobby said, I think I made it to that conference because I'm already studying in Europe. So that was also already the big difference that helped me get to that point. So it would be, um, for me, it really helped that I had the scholarship to pursue further studies in Europe. And I also know that, for example, in the Philippines, many faculty members still do not have um, PhDs. So you can reach a higher level of uh, uh, university uh, level or a faculty position even without one. And I can imagine that it, these um, faculty members without, who are still looking for PhD programs, that they're the best PhD students that we can get with their experiences back home and their access to students, to the local populations. I think it would be great if they would have this opportunity, like what I also got here in Europe. Thank, Thank you. you. I think Dana, you have a response to that? 
Yeah, I was just going to add, as others have mentioned, like the importance of conferences, one big positive I've seen coming out of the, you know, pandemic era is my students having a lot more access to participating in conferences now that more are virtual. Yeah. And I know there are still many benefits to meeting people face to face and there's challenges with virtual conferences. Uh, but I've had a lot of my Kenyan students that can now attend conferences for the first time, especially because airfare is really expensive from Kenya to the US since many of the conferences are in the US. So one thing I wanted to encourage people to think about our societies um, are internet grants, because those are going to be cheaper than travel grants that many societies have done for a long time. But solid internet connection or just buying data bundles can be a limitation for some students. And so that's something I think for societies and research networks to think about because if some a lot of our conferences do continue in this hybrid format moving forward, um, it will open up for a lot more diversity in attendance. And so different little small grants for internet could be really impactful for a lot of people and probably not change the budgets of society tremendously if they're we're offering airfare grants before and now it's internet. So something to think about. Thank you. I think Natalia, you had a comment and then we'll move on to the audience questions. Uh, yeah, I was just a real quick about uh, speaking English. Uh, so from my experience, yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I did a group when I was back from England, I made a group here of uh, English conversation, but not to teach English specifically, but uh, to teach how to argue in English academically, because we are very shy in doing that. And also uh, learning a lang different language uh, is also learning a different culture. So I think oh, people can benefit from joining uh, collaborative teams, international teams, uh, having more opportunities to do that. Uh, one of the things that we learn is actually to learn the dif uh, we learn different academic cultures so I, my experience in England was that I had to adapt to a completely different academic culture from a Brazilian one. So when I didn't only learn how to speak better English, a better English, I did, I learned how to navigate the relationships between academics in, in other places. Uh, so that's why I think uh, a better internet access, uh, international collaborative teams, taking part in international, in international collaborative teams, and also man managing these expectations, as Dana said, this is very important, is really uh, also learning how to deal with all the different uh, research cultures, not cultures and all different uh, national cultures, and even different cultures from different communities within those countries. Uh, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that like, it's not, it, sometimes it's not like just learning English, because I have colleagues who speak English like fine, you can understand them, but they don't know how to send, I mean, they send an email to a colleague and they feel like unsure, like am I speaking that correctly? Are they, are they going to misunderstand what I'm saying? And there is a lot of like non-spoken rules about how to behave in those environments. Yeah. Yeah, navigating sort of the hidden curriculum um, of academic life. Um, thank you. I think we'll move on to the questions because there are quite a few audience questions and perhaps we can return to these discussion points if there's time toward the end. So the first question is, I completely agree that the bias that about the bias that US samples are the default category. But is it also possible that the Western versus non-Western or weird categories contribute to this problem? These labels ignore the extensive within group variability that exists. For example, the US is not only white and middle SES. Any country in a weird category has heterogeneity that is also ignored and underrepresented in psychological science. Can we move to more specific labels such as country? Yeah, we can and we should. Sorry, I'm just going to jump in because uh, I, want, I was one of, one of the people who wrote a commentary criticizing the use of the weird label. I mean, sort of. Um, and uh, I think we should move on. Yeah, it was good. It's a great paper. I recommend reading it. The label isn't, um, it, it just, you just drop it. Yeah. Bobby? Yeah, um, it's, it's an interesting question. And actually the, um, I, the, the study that I, I presented on the journal titles 
Um, we actually had additional analyses related to this. Um, just for the sake of time, I couldn't talk about all the results. But one of the things we also did was we coded journal titles based on whether they're not just referring to a um, qualifying the origin of the sample, but are they referring to a sample that is a minority uh, or kind of a, a specific ethnic subgroup within a country? So for instance, if it was from uh, America, um, that it's uh, you know, the effect of X on Y among African-Americans. So we would code that, give, they, give, give that a, um, a, a new code that was, um, it's a minority group within America. And then so if they said it was like um, with um, among uh, you know, X on Y Turkish immigrants in Germany. So that would be like an effect of um, a, a minority group in a non-weird, non-American weird country. And same thing for Asia as well, or excuse me, not Asia, but the non-weird countries. And what we found is actually it's the reverse. Um, so talking about like, again, the heterogeneity within the countries that we saw this reverse pattern that in this case, if you're talking about minorities, um, minorities in America are actually qualified the most um, compared to other regions of the world. Whereas uh, if you're talking about like assuming white American participants, that's qualified the least in the titles, but about with American, uh, with minority participants, minorities in America are qualified the most compared to minorities in other, any other region. So there is an element of this where um, it's not just about Western or just about American, but it seems specifically about the default sample is like white Americans. Because if you're talking about minorities in America as sample, Asian Americans or uh, African Americans, then it's qualified uh, a lot, which kind of suggests that um, they, may be, um, they may violate the assumption of a, of a typical American sample. Um, and regarding the, the reformulation of the WEIRD label in, that, in our paper, we, we use a somewhat different acronym for WEIRD. We still use WEIRD, but we used uh, WHITE as the first, first, um, first uh, W instead of Western because we classified our countries really based on do they also have predominantly white or European ancestry majority groups um, compared to non-white um, non or European ancestry majority groups because this is kind of this seemed to matter in terms of our, our, how people qualify samples within their countries as well. Thank you. If I could just pick up on that um, in terms of publication, when you're publishing a paper, what do you think is a realizable and sort of faithful way to build culture into your findings? So to sort of describe your sample in detail and also to um, sort of integrate your findings within the socio-cultural context. So, so one approach that's been um, suggested is having some standardization of indicating some you know, constraints to generalizability. So um, whether you know, some journals indicate this in the abstract, it could be in the abstract or some other dedicated section in the discussion or method section somewhere, but having somewhere where it's standardized that you mention who your sample is and at least have some brief statement about who you really think you're studying and who you really think your, your, your findings generalized to. Um, if it's standardized, then in some ways we can reduce this disparity uh, in terms of these assumptions uh, that people have about um, which samples are kind of maybe constrained and which samples are not. And so um, that could be this could be one approach to kind of uh, to try to re uh, reduce these these the perpetuation of these sampling biases. Thank you. Um, Dr. Question is actually also about publication. So the question is, would having a more diverse representation of non weird reviewers result in less bias towards English, for example, as a default reference for the normative basis of English lang infant language development in general? Seems like the problem comes down to an impoverished reviewer pool for top tier psychology developmental journals. Any thoughts on that? Mike? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, uh, I think that the statement isn't incorrect, but uh, is kind of incomplete. Um, so, uh, um, you know, I just highlight uh, efforts like L plus um, that Dr. Garcia talked about as um, ways of broadening participation and building capacity. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I think, uh, right, we, we sort of a bunch of the narratives that we've talked about are about um, uh, studying and measuring and understanding variability in particular phenomena, and then also um, having a kind of a broader participation in determining which phenomena are studied. And 
Um, that second one especially requires the uh, participation of a broader set of researchers. Um, and so those researchers, once they're participating in the global conversation and are uh, publishing, will also be reviewing. So it, it's not just reviewers, it's authors and contributors uh, throughout. So I, I guess I think that that by broadening participation, we begin to create a, you know, a, a broader set of folks that are uh, engaging in all levels of the scholarly conversation around the particular topics that we care about. Natalia? Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out that there is a great study conducted in eLife Sciences journals, I think, because they have access to the pool of um, uh, the country of affiliations from the authors who submitted papers, uh, regardless of if it was accepted or not and uh, the reviewers and editors. So they found really, uh, they, they did find, find uh, homophily, homophily, I, I don't know, it's like affinity, yeah, between uh, the nationality and gender, I think, of uh, editors and reviewers. So indeed, editors and reviewers tended to uh, benefit, like favor people who are more similar to them in terms of nationality of affiliations uh, and uh, I, I think gender as well, I may be misremembering. Uh, so yeah, I think that, that that could help, but it's not, as Michael said, it's not uh, the whole story. Um, and uh, we also have to think about two things, I think, in my opinion, is sometimes we, are, we, are, we want so much to be included uh, people from like any from a country like Brazil that we tend to copy the rules from rules from the dominant group. So I know colleagues that they tend to be even maybe more st even stricter than uh, colleagues in reviewing papers. So if they get a paper from uh, uh, the English didn't uh, look very good, they may be even more. They may be. They may be even more um, harsh, harsher, sorry, um, than uh, English native English speakers. So there is that, and there is also the fact that we have to have groups of people from uh, different places, and not just getting uh, tokenizing people. So it's it, it, you have an editorial board, and then you get like a Brazilian in the editorial board, and it's, and then you feel like this is gonna solve something, and it's not gonna probably it's not gonna solve much because uh, we need more representation. In, in, and people can actually feel more comfortable in uh, seeing different people, diverse people in the team and, and then uh, bring more diversity to the review, the reviewing processes and the editing process. Thank you, uh, Rowena. I just want to add something short. Indeed, it would be great. Uh, I think having more authors would really increase our reviewer pool as well. I'm just thinking about our experience as well, publishing on Tagalog, and we always mention this as well in the title. Of course, this is, um, uh, we have noticed that it really takes, usually the first review would arrive after six months. We have a feeling that it's very difficult for our ed for the editors to find reviewers for our work, and it makes me think: Could it also be related to this fact that um, once um, that others might think that a work on an underrepresented language is like niche or not talking about um, fundamental process that maybe they would say, "I'm not an expert on this one," or that I wouldn't want to uh, review this. Uh, article mm. at least I was uh, that's also a consideration but maybe it's happening so indeed if it would be a more diverse uh, reviewer pool then we would have this hopefully less. Mako? Yeah, I, um, I have a feeling that if the um, the kind of like L1 uh, L plus uh, workshops could offer a training on how to write you know the scientific reviews because the as the non-native uh, english-speaking community that reading a paper in written in english is bad enough <laughs> you know but people do it because it's necessary but writing uh, evaluations and reviews in english is the sort of whole a lot harder to do so even though they may be very qualified scientifically but many of them uh, think it's just too much work you know i have to work you know 
five times as hard to write the one review in English compared to say, write it in Japanese, therefore I'm too busy sort of thing. But uh, the learning experience you gain by writing a review is, is really good for you too. So, but you know, you need a, a sort of some kind of training and then something like that, your workshop will be just a great opportunity to do that. Can I just reply to that later shortly? Yes. Um, I think it's a very good idea, Reiko. We did not think of this aspect of reviewing, but when we were preparing for L+, we really thought of a stream about publishing. So we really have noticed that, for example, um, in the Philippines, I have heard that um, there's this thinking, for example, that there should be fund for paying the publisher. So even from that aspect, aside from the writing per se, because we also have noticed that there are actually several bachelor theses or master theses, but they get stuck there. They never make it to the published ones. And of course, if they're not published, it doesn't reach the global audience. Um, and usually it's because of uh, the fact that uh, they're also very busy, so they do not have the resources to push it to that level. The goal is really to finish your bachelor's or your master's, submit it there, it's fine now. Um, but aside from that, it's also this um, writing a master thesis is very different from writing a journal article as we know it here. So that's also something that uh, would would be great to be, um, if, the, if those from underrepresented areas would get um, uh, training on this one. Thank you. The next question is related actually, it's about um, some of the casualties of increased globalization in publishing. So it, it's the question is, what has been the impact of the dramatic rise in predatory journals and publishers in undermining a legitimate move towards open science publishing? Such predatory journals seem to especially prey upon LMIC, LMIC researchers. I think Natalia, you, you talked a little bit about this, uh, but you're muted. Sorry, just because Dana raised her hand. I don't know, maybe she should go first. Sure, Dana, do you want to go first? No, I, I'm glad you raised this issue because this is something that I have experienced so much um, in East Africa where my students just, it's not their fault. They simply have not been trained on what predatory journals are. And these, you know, um, journals really come after them and they get excited because they think they can publish their first piece. And um, in Kenya right now, the government requires actually for a doctoral student, you have to have a certain number of publications in order to finish your PhD, as well as for a master's student. So it's actually a federal, you know, requirement. And these emails come to them. And so a lot of it is just education and training. And one thing, I mean, for me, I can personally try to impact my own students, but one thing I've been doing more recently, um, I don't know if others have done this in, in their regions as well, but I've been working with two individuals at two other Kenyan universities. So we've been doing these academic writing workshops. They're two, three days long. We do them a lot with uh, physicians, but psychology students, nutrition students have participated. Anyway, we've done these workshops sort of speaking on um, issues like plagiarism, which you would be shocked, but many of them are at a graduate level and have never had any training on that, as well as issues related to predatory publishing and things like that. And so I find that they're really eager and excited to do these workshops when we have offered them, but they also um, have simply just not had the training. And so, you know, not that that can solve everything and it takes a lot of time to set up those things and implement them in different places. But that's been one of the most helpful things I've experienced. And so now I'll have students, you know, email me and say, you know, is this a predatory journal or they're trying to explore on their own. So they're really trying to learn, but I find it, I don't have all the answers because I find it to be a really big problem. And these journals just keep growing in number. And mm -hmm. as you've all have seen, and the names are so similar, to real journal names and they just get, that makes it more confusing. So uh, it, that's a really hard thing, yeah. Thank you, Bobby. I, I just had a short comment to, to build on uh, what Dana was mentioning that, um, but sometimes it's not even just, uh, just students, but even for uh, more experienced researchers, it can be very misleading. Um, like 
especially not predatory journals, but predatory conferences. So if you're working in a new area of research, you're not going, you're not looking for a conference that's like um, uh, in your typical area and say that you worked on some projects or have a new program of research in your portfolio that's a little bit different or out of area uh, or interdisciplinary, it could be also really difficult to detect if um, a, a conference uh, is potentially a predatory one or not. And so I think that at all levels, um, it's uh, this type of training and mindfulness um, and raising awareness would be useful. I just wanted to pick up on that for a moment uh, to bring in a question that actually came to us by email. So we're discussing predatory behaviors between publishers and researchers, but they can also be predatory researchers between behaviors between researchers. So for example, if we see collaborations between high income countries and LMICs, um, it can often be the case that uh, there's a power dynamic that makes uh, the LMIC researcher very dependent on the high income country researcher. So it's not uncommon in our field, for example, to see papers published by authors from high income countries that rely entirely on a data set from an LMIC and there's no mention of the LMIC collaborator participant. Is that something that our field um, should be redressing and what are some strategies for, for addressing that issue? Mike? So, uh, I mean, I think one, one really good way to think about that is by establishing um, kind of broader standards for uh, collaboration and contribution and authorship. And that's something that our field more generally has been working on and that uh, organizations like Psych Science Accelerator and many, many babies are, are working on. In, in fact, um, uh, the, a group of us are hosting a, a, a webinar in a couple of weeks on authorship practices in large collaborations because these challenges are so pervasive. Um, but you know we've we've really been educated by Psych Science Accelerator, who worked to develop a uh, set of forms for uh, a collaboration agreements that that really um, delineate what you can you know what what your expectations should be by doing particular activities with a project, how you document that, um, how you might express dissent with the, for example, the conclusions of the paper, what your responsibilities are once you've say collected data or done analysis and so forth. And I think I think that's really critical because in the absence of such norms and organizations like SRCD uh, discussing and, and commenting on those norms, you do see uh, this wide variation in authorship pro uh, uh, practices. And, and that's been true for you know decades, right? We, we uh, a, a mentor, a fa famous senior mentor of mine, um, reflected to me once on her first experience in developmental psychology, which was essentially writing a, a study and then seeing it published in her mentor's edited volume under his name, right? This, this is, uh, these sorts of things were common and awful uh, for, for many years. So the uh, clear guidelines and clear, clearly articulated standards are a way around that because it gives researchers a way to set their expectations. And I think that those are gonna become increasingly important. Thank you. Uh, Natalia, and then Dana. Uh, I wanted to mention something about the predatory uh, publishing uh, is that it's a very complicated issue. And I totally understand what happens in uh, some African countries, for example, about that. Uh, in Brazil, we do have, but it's a bit of less. I mean, people have more awareness of predatory publishing here, I believe. But I, I just pasted in um, the Q&A, uh, under the Q&A question, I put the thread about the geopolitics of predatory publishing. And it's very interesting because the author uh, questioned this idea because all, more, quite often we tend to uh, relate the idea of a, a predator uh, to these bizarre business uh, that, that um, ask for money to researchers to get their, their paper published, uh, this very obscure website, etc. But in some ways, uh, bigger, more respected publishers, they are also predatory, predatory. And, and um, so there is this discussion about sometimes maybe we are considering some of these publications and these are. Uh, spaces, uh, we call them predatory, but there is really a collateral effect of the, of these people not having uh, an outlet for publishing their papers. They are usually excluded from the main um, 
mainstream discourse in the community that say you have to publish in respected journals that um, make you work for free or when they have like a large profit profit like Eusebia for example and I'm just gonna say the name so I don't know if I'm, I can but we all know <laughs> and uh, uh, so these big publishers so I, I just wanted to put it out there and the um, about the data search and using data from um, developing countries and not having authors from these countries um, I completely agree with Michael and, uh, and but I, I believe I truly believe that uh, journals should enforce norms about uh, publishing papers uh, global papers that do not have uh, they have they should justify why they don't have people from these places in the first place um, mm -hmm. um, uh, journals from uh, global health uh, have been doing this some of them and it's really to try to curb things like uh, parachute science where the researchers go somewhere somewhere else and collect data that they just leave and, and, and leave nothing to that community. Yes, I agree. It's a very foundational issue of who's going to tell the story of a global developmental science and is it really going to be told by the whole globe? Uh, Dana and then Rico. Yeah, I was just um, going to add, I think as Michael said, I would love to see a more universal um, system for authorship because one of the things I've tried to do and has been successful is just trying to set the stage really, really early with a student or collaborator of like what their role will be and does it qualify for authorship or not. Um, because for some of my students or even participants, we have to remember in the area I am lab lab sort of psych studies are a novelty. They're very, very new. And so we often get participants who maybe have never been in that kind of study before. So not their fault, it's very new, but I've actually had even participants in one of my studies ask me, will I get to be an author now? And you know, I'll have to just explain that's not really grounds for authorship. Um, or maybe it's a student who's playing like a smaller role in the lab that doesn't really qualify for authorship. Whereas other students, I may invite them to be part of a project and I sort of lay these things out, you know, you should be a, a co-author, you're gonna be involved in X, Y, and Z activities. So I've tried to communicate those things really, really early before I invite someone into the project. So it's sort of very, um, already very structured. But then there is such a history of local researchers being left off of projects. And um, I mean, it's still going on as well as a, a deep history of that, which is extremely disheartening. On the flip side though, I wanted to just add another issue that I've encountered can also be like guest authorship. So working in a very hierarchical society, like in East Africa, it can sometimes be common practice that people will invite chairs and deans and other people to be a co-author who didn't participate in the project at all. So I've had that experience too, um, as a disclaimer, not at my own institution, but at another local institution where I was collaborating with individuals, all of these people in higher admin positions wanted to be attaching their names to our manuscript when we submitted it, but they played no role in the you know activities of that project. So I think it's important to remember there's both both sides of this that are both is both are issues. Yes, that's an important reminder. Thank you. Uh, Rika? Yes, I guess following up on uh, Dana's uh, sort of making journals or societies like SRCD uh, sort of some open or official uh, kind of statement about how this goes uh, makes it easier for the sort of uh, to explain to the people who want the authorship who isn't really ready there, but they say a young scholar who couldn't really, who will have hard time saying no to the Dean uh, makes it a little uh, easier. Um, the, I guess the one co comment I actually have on this is that uh, having these official rules and guidelines like the, in the open science project that uh, Mike is trying to do, and that's just incredibly, uh, you know, helpful. But I guess there are even beyond that, uh, that, so there are cultural differences. So uh, um, in Japan, for example, it's very, very difficult for people to say no. So the, you know, American uh, scientists who have no bad intention, just want to collaborate, uh, you know, come upon to uh, in Japanese researchers say, would you be able to collaborate with us so that I can send my graduate student to your lab to get some data, you know, this summer? And uh, you know, the 
I know a few people who said yes. And then in the end, they basically had to spend every resource of their entire lab to get this dissertation data for this graduate student. Because they didn't really know, they didn't really think that anybody would, you know, sort of dump upon her lab to get 200, you know, students' data for this guy's dissertation just for a summer. But he, she didn't know that anybody would do that to her. Or, mm -hmm. So it's just one of those things that the expectations are that the, the, the person who came from the US side thought she would say no if it's so difficult. We, it was sort of one of those assumptions that, you know, I'm just doing it, op, you know, sort of in the fair mindedness, in the assumption that if it's beyond what they can do, they would say no. So it's okay. But, you know, for the, the person who receiving it is said that, you know, I was assuming that anybody who's so famous wouldn't think that I can do that without, right? So there's some miscommunications. And so she now says, I will never, uh, you know, collaborate with American scholars to do this kind of research because it just ruined my summer. And that just is bad for both ends. So yeah. it's sort of an educational experience of learning how to go about this kind of negotiation beyond the official statement uh, is probably necessary. Yeah, some sort of implicit cultural understanding that can be highly intangible in a way. Um, thank you, Rowena. You're following up on the culture as well. Um, some of those from low and middle income countries um, might not also be uh, assertive. And I can imagine that they would be hesitant to take on leadership roles. Um, so I have noticed that in L plus, it really helped when senior researchers would give us a bit of a push. Like, why don't you lead this one? Would you like to try? And maybe it's in the spirit of what Reiko said that some cultures would not be able to say no. And then you you said yes, but it gave you a nice opportunity to try and you realize you can do it. Uh, so that's also uh, one possibility. I um, Aside from establishing the, the roles early on uh, in partnerships or official rules, for example, on how to become an author, maybe I'm just worried about um, this aspect that those researchers from low and middle income countries really just have more on their plate back at home so that they have more admin work that in the end they might not really have the same number of hours that we have for the project so I guess that's still a question of what are we going to do in this one we really want them to be involved and they're the best ones to help us in this since typically they know the population the language but yeah with their with the lack of resources time money from their side how can we actually help them? So I turned it into a question. I know we lack time maybe for future discussions. Yeah. Thank you. Perhaps we can have one final comment by Dana. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I think that's really important to mention what, what Dr. Garcia just said that, you know, a lot of our colleagues in a lot of these areas, myself included, and when I've talked to others in underrepresented areas, the workload is very high. When I talk to some of my colleagues in the US, their course, their teaching load is half of mine, and they may not even have to supervise graduate students. So I might be teaching twice as much and managing graduate students and a lot of service activities. Um, and I've seen that from you know colleagues in South America and other regions. And so the time is just really stretched thin. We're not usually given as much time for research. Like we're expected to do it, but we're not given as much time for it. And so I think that is a really big hurdle, but I don't think understandably people in their current job position, they just think it's similar in the other country and it could be so different, the workload. Um, and so I think that is something to really consider when you work with colleagues too, and just try to understand um, their situation. So sometimes I wish there was an award for my, my colleagues in other parts of the world for just the amount of things that um, we're all juggling and, tr and trying to get research done, but maybe that isn't always, you know, rewarded in the same way, um, but that I really hope people can remember that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, take a moment to thank all of the speakers for out of time and also to thank all of the audience members uh, and I'm sorry we didn't get to every question, but I just wanted to uh, share in one final slide how you can still ask your question. Um, 
So we'll have um, a, a, a discussion forum um, actually on April 19th. Um, we'll make the video from this session available to registrants for the forum tomorrow. And then on April 19th, we'll have a second Q&A with the same speakers. Um, so if you'd like to ask your question there, or if you have a different question, um, please feel free to join us. Um, and lastly, we would like to continue this conversation. So we have launched a discussion forum to, to talk about issues of globalization and developmental science. And this is available through the SRCD community page on our member platform. This is also available to non-members, um, which is the SRCD Commons. So if you would like to join this discussion and participate in conversations around globalization, please do join this forum. It's really a place to discuss strategies and ideas to um, move us forward as we try to advance towards a more global science. Uh, so thank you for attending this webinar and look forward to seeing you at the next one.